Good afternoon, everybody. Welcome to uh, new friends of Tosca and a couple of old friends of Tosca out there. So today we are doing our sixth in our series of MOOCs. Today we will be talking about dynamic expressions and execution lists. So first of all, we'll do a little bit of housekeeping as, as always and introduce you to your hosts. Firstly, your May, your moderator for the day will be myself, Tony Leeming, and we are joined with the lovely Sarah Romero, hi. And on the right-hand side, we also have the wonderful Jonathan Baum, who will be answering your questions today. So if you have a questions, uh, question or questions, please pop them into the question box, and Jonathan will be there attentively working his way through them, answering them exactly and precisely. I'm happy to do so. And very happy to do so. He's not really got anything else to do. So today we will be talking about dynamic dates. We will also be looking at the math functions and random expressions. And we will also be talking about buffer, dynam, and the dynamic comparison, as well as the basics of test execution, including how to print a report. I apologize in advance. I seem to have a problem pronouncing test and execution in the same sentence. So let's have a look at some moot, moot, <laughs> MOOC etiquette. As you may already be aware, all participants' computers have been muted. Um, if you, therefore, if you wish to ask a question, please do so in the question box within your uh, GoToWebinar control panel. Uh, we will answer questions both as we go along. Jonathan will be typing uh, questions into you directly. Uh, we will also then try to use your questions if we have time in the Q&A section at the end of the session. Uh, if you could please keep your questions on topic as we are limited on time and we will only be able to answer questions that are in fact relevant to the topic and we will apologize in advance depending on how many questions we get it may mean that we can't answer all of your questions. Jonathan will be working hard to do to hopefully do also but it might not be possible. We are recording this MOOC and it will be available to view on our website, as are the previous five. At the end of the MOOC, we will show you exactly where and give you a guide to navigating the wonderful Tricenter's website so you will be able to find them. So, without further ado, let's talk about dynamic values. Uh, and we'll start on with just generally talking about expressions within Tosca. The way we're going to do this is I'm going to do some talking, so talk about some theory, and then Sarah's going to jump in straight away afterwards and show you the practicalities within Tosca. So you will both see it in theory and in practice. So dynamic values are values that are not generated until the test is executed. These might include item-dependent values. For example, in our web shop, and when we do the when you do the AS1 course, you use a web shop. So using our web shop as an example, they might include item dependent values. Uh, so for example, a transaction number, a customer number, uh, some time dependent values, expiry dates, today's date, uh, a delivery date. We could set all these to be um, dynamic. So they change when you run the test case to a, a date or a, a number or something that's suitable for the time you're running the test case itself. So if we feel doing something along the lines of a regression testing, it means that you don't have to worry about going into your test case and changing each value so it's relevant for the time that you're actually running it. How do you do expressions? Well, all expressions in Tosca follow the same basic um, syntax. That would be curly bracket, then the command, square bracket, parameter one, close the square bracket. Then you would open a new square bracket for a second parameter and close it. And then adding the, all the parameters that you require and then closing it with another curly bracket. As you will go along, you'll see this syntax repeated over and over and you'll see that it's, it's the basic principle is the same for all of our dynamic um, uh, values. So let's start with the actual specific um, expressions and talk about the first that we're going to talk about today, which is random expressions. Random expressions are used to generate random numbers or strings or characters in places where value inputs do not have to be 
exact. So you just doesn't matter what you put in there. It doesn't matter if this name is a, a, na a real name. You can just put some random characters in. You don't have to worry about making up the data yourself. The way you would structure this is would be open curly bracket RND, all capitalized, open the square bracket, put the number of digits that you wish to have within your random number, close the square bracket, close the curly bracket. So this would make a, a random number. So if you wished for a three digit number, you would put the number three within the square bracket. We also have other random expressions. So the next one that you would do would be, it's still a random number, but if you wanted a random number within a specific number range, you would put RND, open curly brackets, RND capitalized, open the square bracket, then you would put the number which is the lower limit, close the square bracket, open, upper limit, close, close curly bracket. So to give an example, which you will see in reality soon, if you wanted the number between 100 and 999, it would be RND square bracket 100, close square bracket, open square bracket 999, close square bracket, close curly bracket. But there's more. We can do random text. <clears throat> so random text allows you to specify a certain length of random text. So in this case, what you would do is you'd be opening a curly bracket, enter the uh, um, random text, again all capitals, square bracket, and then put the number of characters that you want it to be your, your, your random text to be, to be. So 10 characters long, you enter the number 10. You close the square bracket, close the curly bracket. Bear in mind with this one, it includes letters and numbers, but not special characters. So you call random text, which again you will see will have numbers within it. And there's still more. Random decimal will create you a decimal, a, a number with a decimal with inside it. You, the random decimal is the uh, code for it. So you open squarely bracket, random decimal, open square bracket, then you enter the first square bracket would be the digits before the decimal. And then the second would be the digits after the decimal point. So digits before would be two, and digits after will be two as well. So that would be a given number of 14.14, for example. Okay, so let's now move to what this would actually look like within Tosca. So let's see some real life and proper examples. Okay, so um, I'm just gonna be showing some basic examples of uh, what Tony was talking about. Um, if you look here in Tosca, I have already a test case set up. Um, this is similar to the one that Melissa showed you guys last week in the, or two weeks ago um, in the session about test steps. Uh, and here you can see we have still some empty um, uh, test uh, attributes that we want to fill in or some controls that we want to steer. Um, in our sample application, so the web shop that if you've been following us for the last few weeks, you should be familiar with, um, it, the name of a credit card holder um, can be randomized as well as the expiration date and the card code. Um, so here we have to enter payment information in our test case for a Visa card um, and the card number has to be exact, but I can randomize um, some of the information. So uh, I'll just go ahead and show you some of the um, expressions that Tony showed you. Um, the card code, for example, can be a randomized three-digit number. It doesn't matter what code we use. So in this case, um, I can actually use the random expression, uh, opens curly brackets RND, and you can see that as soon as I start to type, so I can show you if I just type the R, um, for all of the expressions in Tosca, it automatically starts to show me um, the different uh, possibilities that I have as I start to type. So in case you forget the exact syntax or spelling of an expression, um, Tosca can sort of help you out there. So um, in this case, I'll simply say I want to have a random three-digit number. Um, so I open curl, uh, square brackets, put a three, and close everything. Um, just one second. It's 
Okay, um, so let me zoom in for you guys. No, okay, it doesn't matter then. Um, okay, so this number now will only be generated at runtime of the test case, and every time that I run the test case, uh, it will be generated as a new random number. I could run this test step now to make sure that the um, to see the, how the value would be input, but if I just want to see how the formula, what the formula is going to be creating, I can do that right here in Tosca without having to run the test step. Um, so I can right click on the expression itself and translate value. And it tells me that the translation was successful um, and it shows me the value that would be generated at runtime. So it's a random three digit number and I can do this as many times as I want. It will always show me um, another randomized digit or uh, uh, number. Um, just so that you can see as well. Um, so this was now the number of digits. I could also put, let's say I needed a number between 300 and 600. In this case, for a range, I would have two parameters in my random expression. Um, the lower and the upper limit of those of that range. Okay, so now I have the lower limit 300, the upper limit 600, and if I translate value once again, I can see uh, which number was generated. Okay, um, for the name of the card holder, I can give you an example of using random text. Um, so I'll go ahead and start typing, and again, Tosca suggests which, um, uh, which expressions I can use that begin with R, so I'll go ahead and push um, that I want random text, so I pushed a tab there and it selected the um, expression I had highlighted, and now I'll just put a number of characters that I want the random text to be. So for example, I'll put 16. And remember, you always have to close every part, everything that gets opened, every open bracket has to have a corresponding close bracket in Tosca. So now I have to close one more time each bracket and can translate the value. And here you can see that random text is a string. Now I have 16 characters of letters and numbers. So just keep in mind that random text may also generate numbers, so it's any random combination of um, letters and numbers. Okay, so those are some pretty simple examples of uh, random expressions. Um, we are also going to now uh, talk about some dates. So here you can see that we need to enter an expiration date and an expiration uh, month and year. Um, and But let's say we don't want to have to hard code that so that it will always be some date in the future. And now we'll show you how you can uh, create those. Okay, thank you for that beautiful move into the next one. So let's talk about some dynamic dates. As just been explained, it means that we can um, we can look at um, putting in dates that will not therefore be dependent upon the date that you're actually running the test. So this is very useful for regression testing uh, and for just making test cases that you don't have to maintain by and changing the dates that you have in there um, and just simply being able to just run the test case and then move on. So let's have a look. So the syntax for date expressions is always the same. You enter the expression. The reason why we put expression there and not the date, there are a number of different date and time functions, of which we'll just introduce you to a few of. Um, but then you put the you expression after the curly bracket. Then you put the base date within the square brackets, the first set. In the second set of square brackets, you will then enter the date offset, so if you wanted to change it into the future or into the past. And last set of square brackets, you include the format in which you wish the uh, date to appear. As again, as, we've already, as Sarah's already said, you must close that uh, curly bracket, so as we always must close all of our expressions. Be aware that the need to be more careful, well, we need to be careful always in Tosca because we always, we're always, we almost very, very often are case sensitive, but the date, the date is very case, uh, case sensitive, as you'll see in a moment. Um, 
It is used to, the expression is used to express a date or time value and is based on your current system settings. So if no format is used, uh, is used or defined, it will revert back to your system settings. It is important to bear in mind because it can confuse. So let's have a look at um, a few types of expression um, and how uh, sort of like how, how they work and what, and, and what they do. So we start out with um, date. Date will return the date. Um, simple enough. Time will return the time. Date time will generate a timestamp. Month last gives you the last day of the month. And month first returns the first day of the month. Base date is the date value in the Tosca date format, depending how you've got that set. You can change that um, if you wish within Tosca. Um, and we'll show you how to do that uh, a little, in a little while. The offset, <coughs> excuse me, the offset, um, it gives you, it gives values that are uh, added or subtracted from the base date. So we've got three examples of you here. Up here. Plus two Y would offset and put the date two years into the future. Minus four capital M will offset the date four months into the past. Plus two D would put two days into the future. The format then is the format that you wish to put it in. And we've got a separate slide for this because again, there are many formats that you can choose. Let's first though, look at the day. If you were to, in that last square and the last set of square brackets, enter percentage D, this is going to express as a uh, express the day as a one digit value where possible. So for example, if it's the 18th, it can't express it in a, in a one uh, in a, on one digit. DD expresses the same day in a two digit. So 08, 18, etc. Three Ds will show the the day of the week in a shortened format, mum, chew, wed, etc. Three Ds will show the date, four, sorry, four Ds will show the date but in the full name of the day of the week, in this case, Tuesday. When it comes to month, it's very similar. Um, you might gather a theme here. Uh, percentage M is the month in a single digit format where possible. Capital M, capital M, the month in a two digit uh, format. Capital M three times, so M, 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 will give the month, but shortened to a three digit, uh, to a three character form. So Jan, Feb, Ma, etc. And four capital M's will then show the month in its full, in the full uh, description. So it's full January, February, March, etc. Finally, at this point anyway, um, year, little y, little y will show the last two digits of the year. So 2016 will be shown as 16 and four little y's, y, 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 uh, would show the full year 2016. Okay, again, let's look at some, it's much easier to look at these in reality. So again, I'm gonna hand over to Sarah, who again will show you some of these examples within the wonderful Tosca. Okay, so um, again, I'm going to show you just a couple different uh, variations of these um, formulas because I do think it's easier just to see it. And um, now that you know that you can do translate value, um, it always helps because you can mess around with the date function when you're trying to see um, how it's going to be input uh, in your test case when it runs, and um, then you can see exactly what you have to modify. Um, so I'm going to just enter first. I'm, I'm going to show you something, so I'm not trying to create an expiration date here. I'm just using this um, value cell to show you some examples. So um, Tony showed you the simple date function, so I'll go ahead and show you 
this. And he said that there were three parameters to enter. So there were um, there were the parameters of um, the base date, the offset, and the format. Um, but uh, one thing that you should be aware of is that you can leave these all blank. And there's a default um, setting that each one takes when it's blank. So you don't have to fill in all three parameters when you're using the date function. Depends on what you need it for. Um, so the default base date, if you don't select one, is the um, current date. So right now, if I put date and I leave all three parameters empty, so I don't know if that's um, clear enough for you guys to see, um, but uh, there's three uh, sets of empty square brackets. And if I translate value, um, you can see that it gives me now today's date, the 23rd of November 2016, and this is in the format that is set in Tosca. Okay, so this is the default format in Tosca. If, um, if I don't have a format set in Tosca, then it will revert to my system settings. Okay? Um, quickly, I'll show you where those settings are located. So, of course, your system settings are the settings you have on your PC. Um, but first, it will always check to see if uh, there's a Tosca setting. To change that, you would go to Projects, Settings, and uh, tbox and here you have dynamic temporal expressions and under dynamic temporal expressions you can change the tosca date format um, and this is the format that you're going to be used uh, when um, creating input from tosca and you'll see there's a couple other things like for example target date format that's when you're trying to read a, the system under test to grab a date let's say um, you would also say, what's the target format that I should be reading? Okay? So that's, you can see that I have day, month, year as the current Tosca format. And that's why when I translate the value, it uses this particular format. Um, okay, so the base date is by default today's date. I can also add any other date. Um, so uh, let's say I could do the... Um, I don't know, 3rd of uh, June 2017 as my base date. And from this date, I can add or subtract time. So I can um, add some time in the future or subtract some time to put it in the past. Um, so let's say, as Tony said, I want two months later than the 3rd of June. I would put plus 2m. M has to be capitalized for month because a small m in Tosca is used for minutes. Okay, that's why we, the uh, d and the y are small, but the m is capitalized. It's because we use the small m for minutes. Okay, so I translate, and you can see that it now shows me the 3rd of August, which is two months um, after June. Okay, so that's pretty simple, actually. Um, I can go ahead. I could also um, subtract some time. So I could say uh, minus three years, for example. So what it's doing is adding or subtracting time from the base date, whatever the base date is. So it jumps back three years. Um, again, if I don't have a date in a base date, then the offset is subtracted from today's date. So it's exactly three years before today. The final parameter, so I'll get rid of the middle part and I'll show you the final parameter. Now I have a setting in my system for the date. I have a setting for the um, for Tosca's date, but I can also, during runtime, create a format not for everything in Tosca, but just for this specific step. Um, so for example, now I'm looking at the expiration date month, and I know I need a two-digit month. So I will tell Tosca to give me the base date, but only in the format of a two-digit month. Okay? 
And when I translate the value, it gives me 11 because that's the two-digit month for the current date. Okay. And of course, if I want to ensure that this is always in the future, I can say, for example, plus three, um, so that, again, as Tony mentioned, if I'm running regression tests, uh, which is probably even more important for the year, um, I can always ensure that whatever date's appearing, it's always in the future, so I'm not going to have a problem with this test case running and then having an invalid date because it's in the past. Okay? Um, so I can go ahead and uh, put in one more date function for the year here, and I can just, oops, so I'll make sure that this is, um, let's say, one year in the future, so plus one year, and in the format of a four-digit year, okay? And this matches the format that I need to input, so in my system under test, I need a four-digit year, so I instruct Tosca to, um, to input a four-digit year that is one year in the future from the base date, which is today. And I just realized uh, in the formula before, I put plus three without um, any, uh, uh, any further information about what plus three what, so I have to add, of course, plus three months. And I can now make sure that every time I run this, all of these values are randomized and the date will always be in the future. Okay? All right. Um, so now, uh, we're going to go ahead and we're going to show you how to do math functions in Tosca. Okay. So uh, just a couple of questions that I'm just going to quickly remember. Uh, please do keep your questions coming in. Uh, we need to keep Jonathan busy. And a couple of there's been a couple of questions which we can answer instantly. We are running Tosca 10. Uh, I should have said that right at the very beginning, but we are using the brand spanking new, wonderful Tosca 10.0. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about math very briefly before we then show you the main way and the main information within Tosca again. Um, Tosca does math, which is excellent news, um, and it does this by using the math expression. It follows the same rules as the basic and all the other expressions that we've already shown you. You open the curly bracket and then you will, with capital letters, type the word math. And then you will have your square brackets. Within the square brackets, you would then need to enter the first value, number one. Then you'd need to enter your operator. Then you need to enter value two and so on and so forth. Then you close the square bracket and close the curly bracket. Again, don't worry too much if that doesn't make too much sense. We will show you plenty of examples, and we'll show you examples in a second. Um, any numerical value can be the value, uh, which is supported, and any basic arith arith arithmetic operation can be uh, supported by Tosca. So plus, minus, multiply, divide, equals, not equal to, the less than, greater than, and so on and so on. We also support other mathematical functions such as maximum, minimum, round, square root, etc., etc. As for all of these dynamic expressions, we are only scratching the surface in this hour. Please do see the manual for full information, full list of operators, full list of different ways of doing dates. We haven't done much on time. We can do time ends, etc., etc. There's more and there's different random functions as well that you can use. So please do go to the manual and you will see a whole different list of things. One common question that I'm going to answer now before you get a chance to jump in and ask it is the difference between math and calc. Uh, calc, C-A-L-C, can be used with Excel. Func um, so we can use Tosca using Excel functions. Excel must be installed locally for it to work. We don't have the time, unfortunately, to cover this today. Uh, maybe if you want, we could do a future MOOC on it if that's what you would like. Just let us know. So let's continue with math. Ooh, let's, and show you uh, some math functions within Tosca. Hang on one second. Okay, um, so this is just going to be a pretty uh, basic example for you guys. Um, I, I want to kind of jump through a little bit faster so we can um, spend more time on the uh, 
dynamic stuff as well as the um, buffers, uh, which we'll show in a second. So I'm just going to do a pretty simple math example. Um, in the verification of prices, um, last week or a couple weeks ago, Melissa showed you how to verify um, values, and she kind of hard-coded some values in there for you. Um, of course, uh, you can actually um, create calculations that um, go during runtime. Um, so a very basic baby example, just so that you see how the math function, the syntax works, um, is to go ahead and open up the math function. And in this case, for example, I will just write in um, 27 plus 10, so you can see that the total should be uh, the subtotal plus shipping, and then I close the uh, the function. Okay, so it's really simple. Whatever operation, mathematical operation you, you want should be included inside of the square brackets. You can, of course, as well embed other expressions inside of math. Um, so, for example, the next couple of expressions we're going to show you, you can embed inside of math. Um, but you will always need to open and close math with curly brackets. You will need to open and close the entire uh, calculation in, with square brackets. And then anything else inside of math, so embedded functions, will also need their own curly brackets and square brackets, okay? And as I said before, just always make sure um, that you close everything you open to ensure that uh, Tosca doesn't encounter an error uh, when running. So um, that's a super simple example. Um, but again, as I said, what if um, you don't want to hard code the 27 and the 10? For example, um, you want to just take this number from the system under test so that you can then refer to that number in the calculation instead. Um, this possibility exists in Tosca. This is called a buffer. And Tony's going to quickly explain to you a buffer, and then I'm going to show you how that works. Okay, so buffers. Buffers are, in actual fact, really very, very simple but they're incredibly powerful. It's one of, the, one of the most powerful things that we can use within Tosca, incredibly useful and really gives your automation a real, a real boost. The action mode buffer, for it is an action mode, can be used to save any type of value during the execution of the test case, which can then be used later on within the test case. Um, and that's pretty much it. Um, it's, it is an action mode, it, if you're using Tosca, will be a yellow color. So when you change the action mode, it will be yellow. And as I said, it saves any variable to a local buffer, so a variable storage memory. So again, we'll show you some examples of how useful this is and how powerful it can be within your test cases. OK. Um, so let's see. Um, let me use, do an example I can run really quickly for you. Um, so I have in my folder already kind of created some um, places where I can show you some uh, buffers. Let me get the system under test open as well. Okay. So here's the sample web shop, which you guys should be familiar with. This is... Um, a simple example with one test step. Of course, this can be done over multiple test steps. You can create multiple buffers, use them later on. So this is a super simple example once again. I want Tosca to grab this name. So every time the test case is run, uh, depending on the user that's logged in, it will take the name from this text box and input it over here. OK? Um, so I will, it will be capturing, reading this name, and inputting that whatever is stored in the buffer into the inquiry box over here so that it can be sent. Um, okay, so I'll uh, jump back to Tosca. And um, here for this text box where the name exists, this is where I now want Tosca to take the text that's there, buffer it, so store it in a local buffer, and then um, it will input it into the inquiry box in the next step. So the first thing that I should do is to set the action mode to buffer. So this is where you would select, uh, as Melissa showed you a couple weeks ago, input and verify. 
This time it's buffer. So we're saying store the value that is behind this text box or in this text box. And now in the value column, I simply give the buffer a name. And the name, in fact, doesn't matter. It doesn't matter what I call it. Um, what matters is that when I reuse the buffer, so when I want to uh, access this value, I use the exact same case-sensitive name. So in this case, I'll just call this my name. Okay. So uh, if I just run this really quickly, okay. Um, you can see that when I run that in the Scratchbook, it shows me that a buffer with my name was created and the value is Joe Smith. So that was the name of the user that was currently logged into the web shop. Um, and I can also see the buffer and all buffers that I've created in the settings. When I go to engine, and here I have a list of every buffer. So here you have my name and there's the current value of the buffer. Okay, to use a buffer value, so now to input the value, I simply, again, same syntax as all other expressions, open curly brackets, and you can see here the fourth option is B. So B means use a buffer, and the parameter, the square brackets, are just, the simply, are just simply the name of the buffer. And when I start to type a buffer, it gives me any buffers that have already been created. Um, so because I ran this test up, the buffer already existed. If I hadn't run it yet, it wouldn't show up. I would just have to type the name, okay? And the action mode here that I'm using is input because whatever value's been stored behind my name, I now want to be input. So I'm using buffer my name and inputting it into this text box, okay? So I'll go ahead and run this step one more time so you can see that what Tosca will do is take the name and see it just input it onto the right hand side of the screen into the inquiry box. Okay, so it stored this behind my name and then used my name to enter it over on the right. Okay, of course I can do this with numbers and as I said, um, you can also, for example, um, buffer a, a value and then use it inside a math function. So super, super quickly, I'll just show you how that would look, but I won't run it. Um, so for example, in here, if I wanted to use, let's say this was um, a buffered number called subtotal. So let's say when I ran this, I buffered the uh, number and the number was subtotal. In place of the hard-coded 27, I would now open a new expression inside the math function called B, tell it to refer to the subtotal, close the entire expression, and then close the whole math expression. Okay? So now basically just embedding the buffer inside of the math function. All right. Um, Tony, I'll hand it over to you so he'll show you the last dynamic expression, and then we'll sh quickly show you expressionless. Okay, so the last thing we're going to talk about with dynamic comparisons is we are going to talk about <laughs> dynamic comparisons. So the last dynamic expression is the dynamic comparison. So a dynamic comparison, which you would recognize with curly bracket XB, closed curly bracket, it allows you to verify the static portion of a dynamic string or value, and you do this by excluding only the dynamic portion from the verification. So you've got a dynamic part embedded within a uh, within a, a non-dynamic. It means you can exclude that part. So you can then um, you can then uh, uh, verify it. it. There is a second option that's also included that comes sort of two for the price of one. Within this expression um, is that it also buffers the dynamic portion of the expression. So it'll verify and buffer it. Primarily though, it is a verification, which is why you almost must always use the action mode verify and not the buffer. So when you're using dynamic comparison XB, you use verify, not the buffer. So let's look at, take a look at it in action.
Okay. Um, so uh, for this, I need to just open up another page in the web shop. Uh, let's see. Um, what we can do is when you place an order in the web shop, at the end, there is a message alerting you that you've successfully uh, purchased something. And then it creates an order number, and the order number is dynamic, but the text around the order number stays static. So we can verify that the text appears, telling you that you have an order, while simultaneously buffering the number itself um, for use later on in the test case. So, for example, here you have the string order number with a colon, and it's immediately followed by an order number. The number is dynamic and changes, but I want to verify that this still appears. I want to verify that the order number with the colon text appears. And regardless of what this is doing, if I were to, um, because we know that in Tosca there, it's an exact match when you do a verification, I, I could either uh, put a wildcard or I can exclude this specific portion, and also I have the ability to buffer it if I want. Um, so in Tosca, I will go to um, one that I've already set up here. So I have this module for this page, and of course I will use the action mode verify. And you already know that I could verify the string order number, just simply typing it in with a colon. Um, but now I could use a wildcard and it would verify just this string, or I can use the expression XB. And XB then, instead of just excluding the number, I can cr put a buffer name here. So it's XB and then a buffer name. So in this case, I'll put order number and close brackets. And what this will do is now it will uh, exclude the order number itself from the verification. So it will only be verifying this first portion of the string. But it will store the dynamic number behind the buffer name order number. And then I can reuse the buffer later on in the exact same way as all other buffers, which is using the expression B. OK? So I'll just run this one test case. Uh, one test step. Okay, and I get the error, generic GUI has no default property to read from. At first glance, it looks like I did everything correctly. I created the, the buffer. I verified um, the string, the uh, static string. But one thing that is really, really important that you have to be aware of is that if you're not uh, verifying string in a business control which has default properties, but something like a container or any control that Tosca doesn't have default properties to read from, then you will get an error. So in order to um, correct this, what I'm doing is actually verifying the inner text of this control. And I have to tell Tosca that. So I will go to, on my test step value, this little drop-down box, the blue one. And I keep the exact syntax the same for the verification and the um, XB here. Um, but on the left-hand side for the property, I have to tell Tosca which property to use because there are no default properties for this type of control. So I will say, uh, verify that the inner text equals order number. Okay, and then it should be fine because Tosca will then know exactly which property to be reading. Otherwise, it just says, okay, I have a container, but what am I supposed to be doing with it? And as soon as I run that, it read the inner text of this container, this control, and it verified that order number that the text exists, and it also stored the value 60696 behind a buffer. Okay, all right. Okay, so the last thing that we will talk about uh, today, last topic is 
test execution. Now, the good news is, for those of you who want to, who, who want to go and get a cup of tea, is we covered most of this last week uh, in the last week's moots. So the key with test executions is we know how to create them. Right click on the folder and choose create execution list. You just need to remember to is the linking of it. So you need to make sure that you correctly link it. So test case to the execution list and the execution list, most importantly, to the requirement set. It will then produce, you'll be able to see graphically the results of when you've run your execution lists. Um, and it looks quite similar to the way it did when, it, when we looked at the requirements structure and when we looked at them within the requirements. So um, let's go and have a look at it in Tosca, I think. It's the easiest way. Okay, um, so I'm going to jump uh, into the execution section then. All right, and I have already an execution list folder created. Um, and inside of this folder, I've created some more structural elements. So it's just like when we showed you last time with the um, requirements, there's some structural elements. Oops, let me go ahead and delete these so I can recreate them with you guys. Um, okay, so I have folders. I've set them up so that I have a, a folder for all automated test case uh, execution lists and um, in there, all automated web shop executions. Um, to create new execution lists, I can simply right click on a folder and select create execution list. Um, here we already have a few existing, so I have um, calculate shipping costs already created, um, and there are some test cases in there. Um, we built those uh, together with you last week. And we also have um, a discount codes execution list, and there are a set of test cases that should be run um, inside that execution list. In an execution list, um, there are a few things that you can see that are really important. Um, first of all, uh, let me focus on my execution list. So I'm looking at my discount codes list. Um, I have four execution lists that have been run. On the left-hand side, so on the left-hand side, I have the result of the most recent execution. Um, the red one mean that it means that it failed. Uh, the green arrow means that it passed. I can also see in the log info here the overall results. So it tells me nothing about the order. It just shows me the number passed, number failed. Um, if I expand each execution list, I can now see all previous runs. So if this is a regression test and these lists are run over and over and over, I'll have the log of every single test that's been run, um, and I can see the results on the left-hand side. I can see the date when it was run. Um, I can see the start time, the duration of the test itself, the whole, ex the whole test case, um, and I can also expand to find step-by-step -step results, just like in the scratchbook. Um, which you're probably familiar with, uh, which showed me, for example, this test case when I ran it failed. I can go through and I can find which step failed, and then I can focus in on that step to see where the failure was. In this case, it was a verification failure. Um, and I can also see, okay, I had expected the verification to give me a, a value of 10, and the system actually returned a value of zero. Um, so I'd have to then go and, and do a little bit more research into where that verification failed, why it failed. Um, I can see the duration that each step itself individually took. Um, and what you'll see here as well is that when my execution list failed or when my test case failed, immediately a cleanup scenario kicked in. So in the execution list section, if you have recovery scenarios that were created and added to your test case in the test case section, they will kick in in the execution section. So this is very important. If you create recovery scenarios, they will not kick in in the scratchbook section uh, when you're running them in the scratchbook, so you can't tell whether or not the recovery scenarios will kick in at the right time. You have to test that in the execution section, um, and you have recovery scenarios and cleanup scenarios Recovery scenarios try at different levels to 
um, clean uh, to fix the test case to get it back to a certain state and then to uh, save the test case to see if it was some predictable um, failure that you can uh, fix and then keep running that test case. And in the event that it's not able to save the test case, to recover the test case, then it will just move on to the next one. So unlike the scratchbook, the execution list section will keep running upon failure. It will just skip to the next test case. Um, any recovery scenarios that are set will kick in to try to save the test case. And if you want, you can set up a cleanup scenario. And a cleanup scenario will kick in um, when a test case is failed. It's about to go to the next test case. And you just want to make sure that you're in a certain state before beginning the next test case. So in our web shop, for example, you might want to make sure that you are completely logged out of the application and that the application is closed. Okay, um, so that could be a scenario where for recovery, you first try to make sure that you're logged in um, because maybe it failed because you weren't logged in. If the test case still fails, then the cleanup scenario resets the state of your test case and moves on with the next one, okay, to make sure that you don't have multiple failures just because of something that goes wrong in the first test case. Um, okay, we also, so, uh, test cases now, because they're linked to the requirements set, uh, don't have to have, they don't have to be set up for individual requirements. You can have execution lists with multiple test cases that cover different requirements. Um, but let's say, because in a multi-user environment, um, I may want to, I may want to have multiple people, let's say there's a hundred execution um, execution entries, so 100 test cases in this execution list for discount codes. I might not want to have one computer or one person running all of those test cases at the same time. So what I can do is, uh, I mentioned this before a couple weeks ago, set up test mandates so that different people, different computers can have um, different portions of an execution list checked out and they can be run simultaneously and all of the results report back to the main execution list. So that's super simple. Um, I right click on a folder in the execution section, so here, web shop, and I can, for example, uh, say I, I create test mandate, so it's right click create test mandate, and I'll, for example, call these uh, Tony's tests, and I'll create one more uh, maybe called uh, Jonathan's tests, so I'm giving you guys some work to do after yeah. the session. <laughs> um, okay, and what I would do is just drag in some of my uh, test cases from the execution section. So I'm assigning two to Jonathan, two to Tony. You can see the execution list remains the same. But now um, they're split up, so Jonathan can check out these two and execute them. Tony can check out these two and execute them. And the results will show up both in their mandate as well as above in the total execution list. OK? Um, all right. Oh, and finally, uh, just quickly, because the reporting section in Tosca is, um, prob probably requires its own uh, session of MOOCs um, because it relies on the Tosca query language, which is a little bit too much to squeeze into the last uh, seven minutes today. Um, if you do want to just print a simple report of the execution section, um, so for example, let's say I want to print a report on this execution list and um, this, the state of this test case, for example, um, you can just simply click on the print symbol on the top right of the execution section. So I don't know if, I'll make sure it's easy for you guys to see here. Okay, so there's a little printer symbol on the right. And um, you can print it to a PDF. Okay, so I'll just uh, put it on my desktop somewhere. All right. And now, exactly how I had it set up in the execution section, um, it will print it. And it will give me now all the information that I saw in the execution section concerning each step, um, the information, what went wrong in the verification, the start time, the duration, OK? 
Okay, so all you have to do is set up your execution list, how you want it to be shown on the report that you print. Um, you'll get the name of the workspace up here and then uh, print to PDF and you have the report there. All right, um, so I'll, I think I already know there was one question. I think we can jump to questions now, is that right? Yeah, yeah. Or do you want to do a recap first? Well, we could do a quick recap. Just okay. go. With, what, what I'll do is I'll just quickly show you, just so you can um, to, to get them set in your in everybody's minds of of um, a couple of the, the the flows of how to do things. So, how to set a buffer. Step one: enter the property, e.g., in a text, and a buffer name as the value of the test step attribute, and then simply set the action mode to buffer how to use a set buffer. So enter curly bracket, capital B, and then square bracket, and enter the name of the saved attribute. Square, uh, the, and then of course you will do the square bracket and curly bracket, and that would be again in the value of the test step attribute. Set the action mode to input or verify, whatever you need to do. Remember that you can also, you can view your stored values in the menu item, project, settings, engine, buffer of Tosca. The next one we just gently is how to use the dynamic comparison feature. Select a test step value and enter the string that you want to verify. Replace the dynamic portion of the string using curly bracket, capital X, capital B, square bracket, and enter the name of the buffer that you are naming it yourself. Remember to close square bracket and curly bracket, and then set the action mode to verify. Really important here, it's easy to forget and to set it to buffer. It's a verification primarily with a buffer. So please, to verify. Okay, so some questions. We haven't got a huge amount of time left, so we're just gonna quickly cover uh, two that have been asked. One question was, can the random text output be formatted to produce characters without numbers? The answer to that is yes. Um, and the easy, the, the again, short answer to that is yes. What you need to do is go to the, um, is, it's a it's a random re-regex is the actual expression that you would use, but this is where the mon the manual comes into its own. As we said, we're only scratching the surface of what you can do with the dynamics within Tosca. Tosca has an incredible feature list of things that it can do and show you. And the way that you're gonna place it, you're gonna find all of these is within the Tosca manual. So we're not do dodging the question, yes it is possible, but for a full detail and an example of how you would do it, see the manual and it will show you exactly how to do it. It also, there is so many different ways of doing so many different things with dynamic expressions that you can look for in there. So yeah, so for that one, you'd wanna in the manual look up regular expressions because you can do regex in, yeah. in Tosca. Um, the other question, which we're not really gonna answer, is one of the questions you've asked is, can we send emails once execution list is done? The answer to that is yes, you can do pretty much anything in Tosca. The long answer to that is though, it is actually something that we can't cover right now. But again, I believe if you go to the support area, you'll be able to find and look in the right, in the, there's a sort of forums and areas like that, there will be the answer of actually how to set that up and how to do it. So what we must we click wanna do now is we're, we are running out of time. And uh, what we need to do is show you, um, I want to show you in the, on the, where the Tricentis website, where you can find all of our um, information that you could possibly require and about the webinar. So if you wish to view the previously completed webinars, you would go to our web, uh, main website, which is of course is Tricentis, www.tricentis.com. You would then go to the Academy and click on About Academy. Uh, <laughs> and it will load, and then you will scroll down slightly until you get to certification resources and news. The lead item, because it is big news, uh, is the fact that we're running these MOOCs and the links to all of our MOOCs that we've run so far, plus the one that we will be running, um, plus today's, in, we'll have the links to the Vimeo so you can view them all again if you've missed them, if you wanna watch them again, et cetera, et cetera. So they're all, they're all here. Um, and we'll add the new ones. Regarding new MOOCs, we do plan to quote a famous Austrian to be back, so we'll be back. Um, but what we need from you is to know what would be the most useful way of us doing this. We would love to know what you'd like us to do in these MOOCs. 
um, how, um, what topics would you like? Would you like to be longer, shorter? Uh, would you like to see items from training or would you like to see completely new? Tell us what you want, what you really, really want to quote the Spice Girls this time and we will do what we can for you. So please, more feedback we get, the more reactive and the more that we can meet your needs. And finally, very finally, just remember, um, if you need more help, contact support at support.tricentis.com or just look at the support site. There are awesome, there's massive amounts of resources on the support site. Contact us at training. We always love to hear from you at academy at tricentis.com and we will come back to you as soon as we possibly can. Look at the knowledge base and look at the online manual. And remember, we're on Facebook, LinkedIn, Twitter. We want friends, likes, shares, tweets, etc. Uh, whatever most of those things mean. Uh, so please feel free to get in touch. So once more, thank you very much from myself, from Sarah, and from Silent Jonathan. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, and we will be in touch soon with the next MOOCs in the series. So thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, and goodbye.